Well, kind of looking over the bones, starting with these. These are the 572s. And, uh, you know, my first impression is, man, that's a small filter for a big saw, right? That's got to be a place for this performance. Um, increase is possible, getting more flow. The handle on this one's pretty squished. It is. I was hoping the handle on this one was not squished. Well, it was not squished, but it is. Oh, well, that's a little bit mashed. It's not bad, though. I mean, that's a, that's a useful handle right there. But that's about the only thing I've found so far that I'm kind of disappointed in. And uh, this one makes quite a bit of, of uh, piston rattle. I'm hoping it was not straight gassed because that's the kind of noise it makes. It runs good, but man, does it clatter. So we're going to pull that apart a little bit and take a look. Now, I might put that piston in there. I'm debating that. And we've got this laying around. I was going to put this on too. And uh, these bars are not really bent up, they're fine. They're actually not bad at all, but I did buy a, a full wrap. So one of these is going to end up with a full wrap. I'm not quite sure which one yet. And I've got a bunch of those. Not a problem. These will always come apart. I had a lot of problem with those things breaking on my 562 uh, hop-ups where I, where I increased the compression. So it's not an unusual thing for me. So maybe I'll put one of those in there. At least I have a spare pull start if I need one. But So I think I can get this one looking pretty nice and running. You know, it already runs uh, pretty quick. I ran it, did a couple loads of firewood with it already just to put time on it. And like I said, the only thing that I have a problem with in my first impression is, yeah, it's got a bent up handle, but it works might get a new handle and it makes a lot of piston rattle. I'm a little bit nervous about that. But other than that, it's fine. More than a few times on on a high hour strato saw, the intake side of the pistons whooped. And uh, I don't know if that means there's going to be wipe on the cylinder, but I'm hoping that's all the problem is. This looks very 372 like or I guess another way of saying that it looks it has a very Husqvarna look to it. And these anti-vibe screws are much like 372 and a bunch of the others where they go into plastic. On this side, right, one, two, three, they go into a plastic. But on the bottom side here, these are metal screws. And they go into a metal bushing. I really, really, really like that. Look at that. Well, look at that. They've got the flat tops. They're not going to pull through that plastic and you're not going to strip them out as easy. That is a definite improvement. So let me get the rest of them off and get that handle off of there. What are the noteworthy things? Um, the uh, screws are all T27s, just like steel, so Husqvarna has copied steel now on these. And this is very much the same layout as a 562. The difference I see is just a lot more space underneath the muffler, but I observed that, what, three years ago? And my kind of fit test to see whether or not that handle is all bent up is, does it fit on the new tank handle and it just lays right in there it's fine so yeah it's got a little bit of curvature here but when I looked at my other uh, saws my 565 and my 572 they both have that as well this one over here is tweaked a little bit but not terribly so this is a useful handle to keep it and uh, again put that over there let me pull the muffler off next and again, you got these four T27s, and when you pull it out, be careful. You want to keep the gasket, because I'm going to put it back on. not quite ready to pull the chain brake off yet if I don't have to. If I can change out 
that piston without moving that chain brake, I think I'm going to do that. I find it kind of interesting that that goes into basically a can, a hole. There's a little baffle there. But for the most part, that muffler is open. So either it was modified, which I don't think so, or that's the way they come from the factory. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to poke a hole in it and do the things we normally do with these things. Right? So a muffler mod on this will be a little bit easier than on a 562. That's, that's kind of good news. That's basically open. All right, let's take a peek inside. If I can. No, I'm looking in there. And I don't know if it's going to show up in the camera, but I'm not seeing anything catastrophic inside. Now that piston does look dry. Very, very, very dry. So, and the gasket's still in there. The only problem I have is I don't have a base gasket that I know of. And I'm not sure whether or not I can do a no base gasket build. So I guess one of the things I should do is a squish test just to see what they are stock. Oftentimes you can tell a little about the saw just simply based on the uh, spark plug. But that looks like a brand new spark plug that has almost no time on it. So it doesn't really tell a story. It's a little bit wet. Usually you'll see a little bit of uh, baked on residue and based on the color of that and the configuration of that. It can tell you if the saw was running lean or rich or even if there's ignition issues. You know, there's a lot of things you can tell from a spark plug. Well, I'm definitely going to pull the cylinder for kicks. And one of the things I'd like to see if I could do is disconnect the Autotune wiring harness right here. Throttle cable and uh, fuel line and also the, the uh, return. Pop it out of its anti-vibe mounts. Pull the four cylinder screws and see if I can take the carburetor and cylinder off as one unit. That would really, really um, help, wouldn't it? I think that would be an advantage. But before I do that, I am going to measure the squish and just see what I have. Well, I'm getting just a little bit over 30 thousandths. You know, 30, 35 thousandths. Which means probably not interested in doing a base gasket uh, removal on this saw. Now I have another set of cases, so when we get the cylinder off, we can check and see if there's clearance issues. But for what I'm seeing right now, eh, if it's under 30 thousandths or that range, yeah, I'd like to have it at 20. But for a working saw that runs good, I'll just leave it. I'm not going to go push that angle. You know, especially if I get a pop-up. Now here's the thing. With the strato saws, sometimes the pop-up isn't the best plan because, you know, Basically, it messes with the uh, the scavenging going across the top of the piston. Have that little bump on there. Uh, I haven't really seen it be an issue with my 562s, but I'm just aware that it theoretically could be possible. But on a saw like this, it doesn't really matter. You know, we'll just put it in there and see what it does. If it works good, fine. If it doesn't work good, that's fine too. I think on a saw like this with the Timing numbers that I think I'm going to see if I decide to go that route. One of the biggest things I can do to increase the performance is just to open up that muffler more than anything else. So I'm going to take that, uh, I'm going to go that direction, I think. But uh, we'll put a pop up in there. If that comes off easy, then do a muffler mod, put it back together. Put a different tank handle on there too while we have it apart. And we'll just see. So, yeah, all right. Pretty much what I expected, I guess. This piston has got a lot of wear on the intake side. That's why it's rattling. That's a lot of wear. So this is the original piston. And while it's not dead, just has a little bit more 
rattle than I would like. And uh, so I'm going to have to come up with a different base gasket. I mean, I can try to put it with a no base gasket build. I just don't think that's going to be a smart move. So, but man, I've seen that a lot. You know, used to see that a lot on the 372s where it was really, really worn on the intake side because it's just not getting the lubrication. You know what I'm saying? Uh, crank feels tight. It looks like it's new almost. So, but this is all it takes to get that, you know, cylinder off, right? Don't even have to take the carburetor off. So, I like that. I mean, I like that. But now I have to go through and change the handle because I am going to do that. I don't want that handle. And uh, This one comes with a throttle but not the fuel line. So I'm going to have to put in the fuel line and all that. And that's a lot of pop-up. One thing I look for is how uniform it is on the bottom. It's all right. It's a little bit sharp right there. So is that. That one's dead sharp right there too. So that's pretty much as they are. So we'll see. We'll see whether or not that does anything other than make it rattle more. <laughs> so the other thing I'm noticing is that gasket's not very thick. Yeah, it might be ten thousandths. So I don't know. Maybe we can try 1184. Just see what it does. What's the worst I could do is go whack. And like I said, this is about bones. So. Maybe we'll try a no base gasket build on this one. We can test to see whether or not that cylinder is going to interfere. All right, let me see if I can get the rest of the handle off. I think that's going to be a little bit of a trick. I think what I'm going to end up doing is popping that tray and seeing how easy it is to get the lines off, you know, and then. Uh, Obviously, this line here goes to the tank, and this one doesn't have one, so I need that one, right? So let me work from that perspective, and then see if I can move the other lines over. So, one, two, three, four. Yeah, notice that we're not doing this with a lab coat on a super clean table. I wish it was cleaner, it's just uh, I haven't had a chance to to get into the shop as much and I wanted to get this done and uh, it's also part of the whole theme you know pretty much any farmer can do it kind of farmer Jones 2.0 when I'm going to drop the cylinder obviously I want to check squish and but I also want to check to see whether or not the flange or some other part of the cylinder uh, interferes with the cases now interestingly enough these have got like a locating pin on the cases, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set that case half up on the cylinder. Check for interference. And it looks to me like it's going to be fine. I can see probably 10, 15 thousandths clearance between the flange. And that looks pretty flush. I see a little bit creeping over here. Let me look on the other side. And see if one of the transfer caps is hitting something. No, yeah, I think we're good. Yeah, we're going to give it a shot. And the other thing is for muffler clearance, I really pretty much have to go in there, come straight out, which is not my favorite angle of approach. And the other thing is it's got that double um, thickness piece of steel there. So that's going to be interesting. I may have to cut that back in order to get enough of a hole. We'll see. But 
I do want to put a pipe on that, probably a three-quarter inch diameter pipe. Uh, notice that's pushed in. I mean, I could probably just open up this a lot. That would open up that pressure can quite a bit, reduce the resistance. But that's not what I like to do. So where do we go from here? I think the first thing is to get rid of that, that piston. That piston is not what I would prefer. I don't like to look at that piston. Um, while we're looking at this, I want to point a couple of things out. Now these 572s, this is one of those 800 pound gorilla in the room type discussions too, by the way. You know, you get a lot of guys, when they talk about porting, they miss a couple of really key parts of the whole game. I mean, you can open up those ports and make them all big and the big transfers and stuff like that. There have been times where I do have to open up the transfers in order to be able to pick up some RPMs on top. But just opening up holes, that's only part of the story. If you can't pump the fuel-air mixture through those holes, you know, the velocity gets a little bit too low, you start having issues with scavenge and fuel dropping out of the mixture and stuff like that. So one of the keys to the increase in performance on these Husqvarna's is the, the bore and stroke ratio. And if you look over time, as Husky has evolved their 70cc saws, the 272 was a relatively short stroke, larger diameter piston, 52 millimeter piston. The 372 with the same displacement had a 50 millimeter piston and a little bit more stroke, but also quite a bit more transfers. Those things had to happen in concert, right? In order to get the higher RPM power they were looking for, they needed to flow more gas and air. So they opened up the transfers in order to do that, along with other things. I'm just talking about those two specific characteristics right now. But in order to take advantage of that, instead of just raw RPMs, they increased the stroke. And that means that there's a larger change in volume as the piston goes from top dead center to bottom dead center, which means it's a little bit more uh, ability to pump or more primary compression. And then, lo and behold, yet again, the next evolution of their 70cc saws, they went from a 50mm bore on the 372s to a 48mm bore on these. They still have the same displacement. So yet again, they're, they're doing a couple of things. One, with the stuffers, they're actually shrinking the overall volume in the cases, but they're also by having more stroke, having a larger amount of relative volume change as the piston goes from top dead center to bottom dead center, so effectively it's more primary compression, which means it's increasing the velocity of that uh, mix through the transfers into the top end. You know, it's basically a stronger pump is what it is. That's the way to look at it. Of course, I also look at it as a little more pulse, too, for the carburetor. <laughs> it's just, just a lot of stuff that happens. A person who wants to port these things, you you got to take that into account. And maybe you want to open up a little bit or blend the radiuses a little bit, stuff like that, to make things flow better. I don't think you're going to find some quantum leap on how much gas air mix you're going to get through that saw. Um, and then, of course, in my mind, the 800 pound gorilla in that room with these autotunes is how much fuel can you get through that carburetor. There's only so much it's going to be able to deliver and that ultimately determines how much horsepower can be made with that setup assuming you're using the same carburetor. And uh, I would say that the Husqvarna engineers have got a reliable blend. It's what they do for a living. We might be able to, to tweak it and get a little more here and there, you know, a little more compression for um, a little more efficiency in the burn, although that's really specious at best. They've done a pretty good job. You know, open up the muffler, get some heat out. I'm not sure that's going to do a whole lot for power. Might, you know. But really, I mean, these are engineered machines. And they're engineered for a lot of power 
and reliability, that blend. And while we go in there and mess around a little bit for fun, it's really hard to out-engineer the engineers. So what I want to do is a derivative of what I've done with the 562s. I want to pump the compression just a little bit. And yeah, I'd rather drop the cylinder. I'd rather take that approach. I don't know if you've noticed, but these new Husqvarna's have got a really nice square switch band. It's kind of hard to see with this one. It's dark. And I'm not going to improve on that. A lot of the older saws, it made a lot of sense for me to go in there and cut the squish band because there was a ridge or they were rough. They just simply weren't nice and nice and square. But the Husqvarna's have been nice and square for a long time. I think the last model saw where cutting the squish band really made a big difference was the 576s. But the new x 372s, they've been nice. You know, so unless you want to really shrink the combustion chamber, it makes no sense to cut the squish band on those. And uh, the same with the 562 and the same with these. There's no sense in doing that. You know, it's too easy to lower the cylinder. There's no sense in cutting the squish band because the other thing for me is there's no sense in getting more than, say, like 180 pounds of, of compression. You know, 180 PSI on the top end. Anything more than that gets harder to pull over and you're starting to do things like brake pull starts and stuff like that it's not really worth the gain you know unless you're a race saw and I'm not I shoot for like 175 you know and the first thing we'll do here is instead of monkey around with that too much is we'll just drop it and see what we have take the gasket out put you know 1184 in there see if it lasts it may not last with that additional primary compression, some of the games that we could play with the older saws that didn't have that kind of compression in the bottom end might not be able to play with this saw, I don't know. And of course, another thing is, and this has been pretty much true with a lot of the of the x -Torx. there's not a lot you can take without compromising the strength of that flange so I wouldn't want to cut that cylinder much anyway 10 15 thousandths at the most and that's why I go to the pop-ups you know yeah theoretically uh, that little ridge right there can uh, you know mess up the scavenging although I have not seen evidence of that but it could this one here is a little more pronounced than the 562s in um, but I get the increase in compression without machining and without compromising that flange at all but also without any opportunity of of changing the angle of that cylinder you know unless you really know what you're doing trimming the cylinders is a is a kind of a crapshoot what I do with my arbors is I actually thread them on to the uh, the spindle of the lathe itself so there's no chuck basically drill and thread a hole and then uh, then I trim back the arbor to the slip fit and then when I thread it onto the spindle of the lathe it's about as true as it's going to get can't get any truer in that way I eliminate a lot of the potential you know angle of the cylinder relative to the cases so I'll keep that kind of true I actually got the first one I did right here basically what I had done was made up this kludge. This was to test a theory where I bought one of these and then grafted the uh, the aluminum to that and then cut the aluminum to the diameter I was looking for. And when I thread that on my lathe, guess what? That arbor is true every time. And this was because I'm making another one or was going to make another one. I don't know if I'm going to bother now. But that's that was a uh, that was a huge, huge, huge change for me when I started doing these. And I've got like four or five of them for the different diameters. I got them for 5.62, 50 millimeter, 5.72, and I was going to build one for a 52 millimeter. And pretty much quit doing the lathe things. I just ran out of time.
So we have a 372 like puzzle with a handle. And let me get that out of there. Pull the, that through. Pull that out. I decided to use the OEM wrist pin because it's a lot thinner and I'm sure they've got it balanced better. This is what came with the kit. And I'm also using the OEM uh, clips for the same reason. I think they're a little bit better than what came with the kit. tall piston. That was quite a bit larger diameter. And I know with the 372s, the uh, the newer versions of the wrist pin actually matter. This all balances out better. So, all right. So now what we got to do is figure out how to get the handle back on. Yeah, that crank looks nice. Everything in there looks pretty good. But, I'm hoping what this does is basically proving without doing a whole lot of talk and chatter about it that the things that you typically need to do to work on a saw are still available to you even if you have a dreaded autotune. I'm going to throw that piston and stuff right out. Top ends, pulling carburetors, swapping carburetors, fuel tanks, pull starts, just the block and tackle the things that a typical repair shop has to deal with. You know, if the saw came in for repair, that means at some point in time it was actually running. So the carburetor and all that, you know, you might have to put a carb kit on there. They are chainsaws. But for the rest of it, you know, it's just pretty much the same. Tear apart, put parts on it, put it back together again. Now my shortcut probably is going to end up not being a shortcut. Trying to do the handle and all that. Probably costed myself a little bit of aggravation and time. By not just pulling the the line out off the carburetor. The problem is, I don't see an easy way of getting to it. Otherwise I would have done that by now. Pulling this line off the uh, off its little perch in here. get some solar bolts in if I can. Do I have enough squish to keep from having a disaster? Okay. Let's measure the squish now. 
Let's see what we have for squish before we go too much further on this. We have a measurement. We are exactly, exactly at 20 thousandths. Wow. What are the chances? So does that mean I have a running saw? I don't know. The trick's going to be getting the fuel line on. Once I get the throttle cable on, I can probably put the plug in and put the muffler on and see if it will fire. All right. Got that little kinked line on there. This stuff kind of goes up and over the top of that little kinked line and goes into the little brace there. So that's back the way it's supposed to be. A lot of works. Let me get the anti vibe in. There's one. Fuel lines are on. Anti vibe is on there. See if this works. Yep. yep. So we effectively have most of what we need to have a running saw. Let me put the handle back on. I think the point for me is, yet again, these are the kinds of things that someone's going to want to do to their chainsaw, you know, and none of these things are going to require, you know, a common service tool or any intervention by the dealer. These are all things that you guys can do by yourself. And when you think about it, Clutches, oil pumps, cylinder changes, you know, these kind of things. That's usually what a saw shop has to deal with to repair a saw. Carburetor kits. You know, it's that the, that's the type of thing... Um, that is more typical than having to reprogram the, the carburetor because usually by the time a saw comes in broken, it's got a fair amount of time on it, which means it's obviously been a running saw for you know a period of time. But it'll work for now. Sounds pretty good. Alright, point being is I could tear all the part, cylinder off, carburetor off, tank off, and still runs you know when you put it back together still runs because the carburetor and the firmware were not in any way shape or form uh, disturbed with and uh, we now have a saw that has a brand new handle a different piston 
and then tomorrow I think what I'm going to do is do a muffler rod on it. Tonight I just ran out of time. Also I've got to put a limiting screw right there so it limits the motion that got broke off. But uh, what do you think? You know? There you go. Part one. Part two is muffler mod and running it.